Hi, welcome everyone. Welcome and thank you all for joining us at Partners for Dignity and Rights for this series of report backs from organizations that are working on the front lines of this pandemic. In, in a very recent conversation I was having actually with uh, Jordan Flaherty who helped organize this and as our director of communications, we were asking ourselves, what is the most important message right now? Because there are so many things to say but the one we thought was most fundamental was that we can forget no one in this moment, certainly not those most affected. And that's not a new message, but has a very deep resonance right now. There's also been, as all of you know, a growing conversation about what is essential. We've stripped our economy more or less to what we think is essential. And what has emerged as the answer is food, healthcare, the goods we need to stay healthy, education, housing, basic income, in other words, our economic and social human rights. You put those two things together, forgetting no one because everyone deserves what's essential, and you have captured the core value of our social justice movements. But at this moment, we have seen in even starker terms that our society is not organized toward that end. We treat what and who is essential as expendable. Filling in that gap as best as possible is our community infrastructure and organizations like you're gonna hear from today that have gone into overdrive to protect people. Everyone you hear from today is working 24 seven to harness our organizations and social movements in this emergency to save lives. And their efforts need you to support and as much as uh, need your support and as much visibility as possible. So what you learn here, please share it because you don't know when your advocacy as an ally reaches a journalist, a decision maker, a donor, a public health expert who can strengthen these efforts on the ground. We must all be partners in this moment. Finally, every single organization you hear from today also has a long-term vision. And when we win, I learned that from CIW, by the way, I forgot to say who I was. I'm Kathy Albisa, one of the co-founders of Partners for Dignity and Rights. And CIW, who you'll hear from today, taught me to always say when we win, not if we win. So when we win, we will have far greater resiliency as a society to face the next pandemic or other crises that are inevitable. And what our partners have in, our mo in, this, in common is they know that the solutions are not technocratic, they are democratic. In this moment of mutual aid and solidarity, we know and feel that more deeply than ever. As COVID becomes less of a threat, we will face the aftershocks uh, of a likely looming economic crisis. As a result, we are seeing larger calls too to make some of the emergency responses people are fighting for here more permanent, a part of how we restructure our economy from guaranteeing healthcare to ensuring basic income, to ending evictions, to increasing worker power. As this emergency has demonstrated, it really is an option. We actually got a question before this event via email asking, couldn't we do all these things adopting alternative economic approaches like the person cited modern monetary theory? I'm not an economist, uh, although for whoever wrote that, I am impressed with what I've read about that theory, but I don't know what the theoretical answer is. I do think that part of the real world answer lies in how we respond in this and the next phase of this crisis. And that will likely determine our future. The only thing I have no doubt about is that our best possible future lies in the success of our social movements and organizations like these. You'll be hearing from a range of essential worker groups, uh, groups working on other essential areas like education and healthcare. We will hear from a wonderful poet and then we will have reflections from one of the most amazing supporters of our movements, Regan Fritzker of the Libra Foundation. So thank you for joining us and for your support. And again, because we all need beauty and culture in our lives, I'm now going to turn it over uh, to our poet, Cynthia Dewey Oka. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me to be a part of this. And um, I really, that resonated so much with me, what you were saying, Kathy, about this moment being about not forgetting anyone. Um, 
In the interest of care for time, I'm just going to read one poem. And um, I want to say uh, something quickly about it is that um, it's this moment feels personal, I think, for many of us because we are feeling the impact of this crisis in our families. Um, my parents were both healthcare workers back in Indonesia where we used to live. Um, and my father struggled with years and years of unemployment after we migrated to Canada. And um, it felt like an apt moment to share this poem. For my father who once rubbed shoe polish over his bald head. She said not to say anything because it gave you hope, which reminds me here is the world you cannot enter. Though you brought us against the wishes of the Bougainvillea, grown in clay pots arranged like soldiers between your daughters and the wrought iron gate on the other side of which dogs, unleashed, licked themselves to sleep. I envy sometimes these days, their mud-hardened coats, shaved as I am to a worry over my shrinking Antarctic of time. No, it's not even that. The poem I should have written by now, I mean. What was sliding around inside you all those years my painted face speaking English as though it never knew another purpose while you knelt beside a creaseless bed, a man reduced to nothing but hours. Oh, you kept yourself busy, cooking, cleaning, washing, sewing, tying my mother's shoelaces on the steps of the bus, but purpose that is a word for everything we have not yet found the strength to cast away. It must have been terrifying, your child, her thin wave through the fluorescent walls of a McDonald's on the first shift of her first job. You waited and waited for me to come back, for anyone to say, you are not done yet. And while you waited, other things happened, eggs spoiled, mirrors rusted, a child thought herself a dog and the rain clapped. I don't to this day question your version of events. When your grandson was little, my body attacked the hair on my head. It fell in fistfuls until I was half lunar. I felt close to understanding then why you did what you did. He is 16 now and refusing to cut his. All night I hear him talk with no one I can see in a world I cannot enter. He is not worrying about getting a job. He doesn't say, leave me be. Clamps headphones over the black grass, just like I once did in my greasy uniform not recognizing you, then not holding my laughter. Pa, it wasn't that you hurt me. You did. It was that you tried and kept trying to do what you thought a father should. So that gripping the wheel with both hands, you picked me up. That night, the moon was more touchable than any country for my first shift at my first job like a man who hasn't been shedding himself in the dark. So that right then, looking away from you, my whole world was smooth, not a single blade survived. Thank you. Okay. Uh, no, thank you. Um, that was beautiful and really, thank you. That was beautiful and really, you know, evocative of the struggles of, of working people that come to this country and those who are brought to this country and those who are from this country who are trying to, you know, put together decent lives. And you'll hear about some of those struggles now from our, our first report back 
from Lupe, Gonzalo, and Marley Munachelo, uh, who's going to be interpreting for her. So thank you, Marley, from the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Let me hand it over to you. Yeah, I think we're ready, Lupe. <laughs> bueno, pues gracias por compartir ese poema tan bonito y bueno, eso también pues nos da eh, pues un sentido diferente, ¿no? A todo este momento que estamos pasando y pues sí, queremos también compartir un poco sobre el trabajo que nosotros estamos haciendo aquí en Imocali. And so first we want to thank you, uh, Cynthia, for that beautiful poem. It really brings um, a, new, a new level of meaning uh, to this moment that we are living. And uh, so we are happy today to share some of the work that we are doing. Um, pues, eh, mi nombre pues, es Lupe Gonzalo. Yo soy parte de la coalición de trabajadores en Imocali. He trabajado 12 años en la industria agrícola, cosechando diferentes frutas y vegetales. Y ahorita pues estoy trabajando como staff en la coalición. So hello everyone, my name is Lupe Gonzalo. I work with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. I have spent the last, I, I spent 12 years working, uh, harvesting many different kinds of fruits and vegetables. And now I'm here representing uh, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers as a staff member. Y la coalición es una organización que ha luchado por más de 25 años para proteger los derechos humanos de los trabajadores, eliminando los diferentes abusos que trabajadores enfrentan dentro de la industria. And for the last 25 years, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers has been fighting for the human rights of farm workers uh, to combat the abuses that they have faced in the fields. El, el enfoque de, de la coalición es presionar a las grandes corporaciones para que se comprometan a firmar acuerdos y que los ranchos donde ellos están comprando sus tomates, pues los trabajadores sean respetados sus derechos, pero también eh, concientizar a los consumidores, ¿verdad? De dónde vienen sus productos y cuáles son las condiciones que los trabajadores enfrentan. And the main focus of the coalition, the coalition of Immokalee workers is to principally focus on the large corporate buyers of this produce that we harvest in order to ensure that where the farms on which they purchase, workers' rights are being protected. And in addition to that, we uh, work to raise consciousness among consumers to understand the conditions behind their food. Y ahorita, pues, después de esa grande lucha con las corporaciones, tenemos 14 corporaciones que han firmado y pues hemos creado el programa de comida justa la cual pues significa que por primera vez los trabajadores tienen derechos en su lugar de trabajo, el derecho a tomar agua, eliminar el acoso sexual, la esclavitud moderna. Y bueno, pues eso es un impacto bastante grande que ha causado dentro de la industria de tomate. And so after this long fight, we have won 14 agreements with some of the largest corporations, uh, food, food buyers in the world. Uh, and we're able to create the Fair Food Program, which ensures the basic human rights of workers on the farm, such as the right to basic health and safety, like being able to drink water, the right, the right to work free of sexual harassment uh, and violence, as well as, sex, as well as human trafficking. And that has had an incredible impact in the agricultural industry where we work. Pero bueno, pues ahorita estamos eh, todos enfrentando una, una epidemia, ¿verdad? Como se estaba mencionando al principio, es algo que nos ha afectado a todos personalmente. Y bueno, pues ahorita hemos usado nuestra fuerza para proteger a la comunidad de Imocali, eh, que al principio pues de esta crisis fue olvidado del mundo. And so of course now we are, as, as everyone is, confronting this epidemic. Uh, and this is, and as many had mentioned earlier, uh, this is something that's very personal and it's affecting all of us personally. Uh, and so what we have done is turned our strength and our work towards protecting the community of Immokalee and protecting farm workers during this epidemic that at the very beginning of this crisis truly was forgotten. Eh, somos trabajadores esenciales. 
pero reemplazables, ¿verdad? No había protecciones para los trabajadores, el gobierno local, el gobierno estatal, pues no estaba apoyando nada a los trabajadores, nos, básicamente nos dejaron desprotegidos, muchos de los trabajadores no tenían desinfectantes, mascarillas, guantes, todo para el cuidado personal. And although we are essential workers, we are treated as if we are replaceable. And, you know, at the beginning, in particular, the local government, the state government had essentially um, forgotten us and left us wildly unprotected. So we didn't have very basic protections in the fields in order to uh, in order to ensure our own safety. Y básicamente, pues no se escuchó en los medios sobre trabajadores agrícolas como héroes, ¿verdad? Así que en Imocali, pues nos, nos organizamos para hacer educación de salud, para que la comunidad, pues, tuviera conciencia sobre cómo protegerse. Eh, también organizamos aliados para luchar por más protección, por pruebas en Imocali, un hospital de campo. And so uh, what we did in response to that, you know, recognizing that even in the media, there was no discussion of farm workers as heroes, even though they are also on the front lines as essential workers. And so um, in our community, we began to organize ourselves to educate everyone in the community to ensure they had the information they needed. We began to organize with consumers and with the public to advocate for more protections for farm workers for everything from testing to a field hospital to ensure that there were actually resources we needed. Todas estas cosas que nosotros empezamos a exigir al gobernador de Florida, es necesario en nuestra comunidad un hospital donde los trabajadores se puedan atender con médicos especializados, pruebas eh, masivas, ¿verdad? Para los trabajadores en Imocali, porque nosotros vemos a Imocali como, como leña seca, ¿verdad? En medio de un incendio, se tenía que hacer bastante trabajo para poder eh, mm -hmm. que llegaran nuestras voces hasta el gobernador y que pudiéramos ser escuchados. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, these were elements that we really needed. Again, workers didn't have PPE like gloves or anything like that, uh, or masks. And so these elements of having significant testing in Immokalee and in particular a field hospital were essential. And we had to um, really fight hard in order to um, bring this campaign to the doorstep of the governor of Florida to ensure that we were able to actually get some of the protections and the resources that we needed. Entonces nuestras voces como trabajadores se escuchó solamente por eh, los medios de comunicación, eh, entrevistas con CNN, CBS, el New York Times, otros medios, ¿verdad? Porque estábamos siendo ignorados y la verdad es que como trabajadores tenemos una gran necesidad. Muchos de los trabajadores tenían miedo de ir a trabajar porque estaban poniendo sus vidas en riesgo. And so through those efforts, the voices of workers were heard through, you know, many of the media outlets of this country from CNN and CBS, the New York Times and Univision. Um, and so, you know, through all of that organizing work, we were able to ensure um, that that workers did start to get some of those protections. Entonces, trabajando juntos como trabajadores, como aliados, también pues la petición que lanzamos al, al gobernador de Florida, para pedir todos estos productos que era necesario para nosotros, ahorita pues llegó en un resultado. Eh, apenas este fin de semana van a proveer eh, pruebas gratis para los trabajadores, accesible. Y eso es un gran paso, ¿verdad? Pero todavía hace falta mucho trabajo por hacer. And so through that organizing work, through the efforts uh, of allies as well as workers, and uh, really bringing this campaign to the forefront, we were able to have a major victory that was actually just announced yesterday. So now the government is going to be providing significant levels of testing in the Immokalee community. And we know that this is just one step forward, but it is an incredibly important step. Entonces fue básicamente nuestro esfuerzo de poder como organizar los trabajadores, combinando con el poder de nuestra alianza de consumidores y la solidaridad de otras organizaciones eh, que creó el programa de comida justa, al igual es lo que nos ha protegido en este tiempo de epidemia. Gracias. And, I, I think we're, we're out of time, but if you want to add one last uh, comment. I'll just, that was, yeah, I'm happy to translate that last point. Sure, okay. 
Great. Um, and so it was really tying that all together. It was our power as an organization of workers combined with the power of our alliance with consumers and the solidarity of many other organizations. That was what led to the creation both of the Fair Food Program and also allowed us to protect ourselves during this time of an epidemic. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for the for what I know has been an intense uphill battle. Getting anything done in the great state of Florida, which is my home state, is, uh, is never easy, especially with your current governor. So congratulations on the progress you've made and we're all behind you in the ongoing work. Um, and now we're going to hear, I look at my list properly here, from uh, Tim Bell, the executive director of the Chicago Workers Collaborative, uh, working with temp workers in that sector there who are working hard to produce uh, the things we need. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Chicago Workers Collaborative builds power with temporary workers. In Illinois, there's about 625,000 temps who work in low wage, uh, light industrial, warehousing industries, overwhelmingly Latinx and African-American workers. Um, on March 20th, Governor Pritzker issued an executive order uh, shutting down the schools and businesses um, that uh, across the state. Um, and accept those that are producing essential goods. By March 23rd, CWC's workers uh, called an emergency meeting because nothing in the factories had changed, just like Guadalupe said. Um, old action needed to happen because the workers know that uh, bosses could care less about them when there's money to be made, especially when they are attempts, which are generally, uh, th there's a feeling that the workers are just throwaway workers. So they decided on a two-pronged uh, campaign, a workplace organizing track by organizing concerted actions and walkouts, and a policy track in the form of an online petition to Governor Pritzker. Uh, the petition uh, included um, uh, banning the use of buy-a-touch punch clocks, so workers don't uh, share their germs with each other when they punch in, to provide time off of work, uh, uh, pay for workers who are sick, quarantined, or must stay at home with their kids or their elderly parents or, or other family members, and then enforceable requirements uh, for protecting workers. Uh, our strategy was to force the governor's office to react to the situation of companies are spreading the virus. And our motto was protect us, protect yourself, by exposing how companies uh, were a public health threat. Our lead organizer, Janelle White, led a digital organizing campaign, which included a series of web talks on why the governor needed to act. And the talks were co-hosted by a worker and an expert and streamed over Facebook Live. Uh, worker leaders took pictures, uh, videos, and recorded interviews. And this fed our social media imagery and gave content to share with press. Many thousand workers were also engaged over Facebook and started complaining about the unsafe conditions. Uh, OSHA sent us an email when we requested one saying that they were not gonna take any action against factors, factories that were breeding the virus. And so we, we needed to convince our state's uh, AG Labor Rights Bureau to begin to enforce uh, health and safety protections according to the executive order. Um, on April 1st, a photo of a line at Voyam Beauty in Countryside, Illinois, appeared on the front page of the business section of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the University of Illinois School of uh, Public Health issued a call to action, and uh, we hosted a web talk with the leaders of the school who echoed the message about the impending public health disaster. On, uh, by April 10th, uh, we had sent the, uh, the governor's office a petition and a legal memo that was written by Brittany Scott of Partners for Dignity uh, and Rights explaining how the governor had the emergency authority uh, to implement and enforce the policies in our petition. But also many bad things started to happen within our organization. Our board member, Barry Rose, was hospitalized with COVID-19 and nearly died in the ICU. Uh, worker assembly leader, uh, uh, Cecilia Jacobo, uh, and her daughter pictured here, uh, both uh, were infected with COVID-19. Uh, and then finally, um, the, worst, the, the worst nightmare happened. One of our members, uh, Norma Martinez, mother of two, 
a temp worker at Voyant Beauty and Countryside where workers had already uh, 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 been agitating died. Uh, and the workers had a, a protest in mourning, uh, una protesta de luto the next day. By this time, you know, workers have been uh, marching on the buses, um, uh, uh, walking out, uh, presenting petitions. Uh, we're thankful to the attorneys at the National uh, Legal Advocacy Network and Raise the Floor Alliance for helping put together the boilerplate for these petitions. Um, and finally, a perfect storm of public health officials, uh, 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 thousands of complaints that went into the AG's office and the wave of news stories uh, convinced our governor to take action and amend the executive order to provide more enforceable protections for workers. And it's imminent that he'll announce a plan to create a fund for unemployed and documented immigrants to create a safety net. Finally, we began a COVID-19 worker activist relief fund to provide $500 stipends to unemployed temp workers to join what we call the COVID-19 labor brigade, to essentially become trained activists and volunteers in the present struggle. And you know, we raised over $37,000 to date, which pays for 74 activists uh, to become engaged with the goal of building a brigade of about 100 activists a small army of leaders to build power in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. Um, I know that um, I know temp workers are working shoulder to shoulder under incredibly dangerous conditions. So we appreciate the hard work you're doing out there. And um, let's keep our eye on Chicago. Uh, we're gonna hear next from Magali Licoli from Venceremos. The poultry sector is another one that's been hit hard. Uh, probably been reading articles about the deaths and the conditions. Uh, Magali is working with people to actually change that and find solutions. Thank you very much for inviting me to share with you what's happening at the processing plants. As you know, processing plants right now are at a hotspot of COVID-19. So it's been a month ago whenever we saw an urgency to mobilize workers to organize the community because people were just terrified of going to work. And so we began uh, doing an online campaign calling on all of the supporters because workers, as everybody had mentioned, the essential workers were the less protected among others. And so we began uh, petitioning for paid sick leave, for a wage increase, uh, for protective gear equipment. It's been uh, a fight and companies have started giving something, but we are talking about that a week ago, two weeks ago, workers on the processing lines were not granted any mask, any basic protective gear. Um, to do their jobs. And so it's been like the company fighting what we are doing, trying to convey the, the, the public that what they're doing is right and what they're doing is to protect the workers as much as they can. And so we began understanding that we really need to build workers' power and that we really need to have the workers fighting that and speaking the truth of what was happening inside the plants. So we, it's it's been like two weeks ago, we began with petitions from workers and organizing with workers what they wanted and what they wanted to see in their jobs. And so they began drafting a list of what they wanted for, from the company. And I've been organizing workers from two different plants, primarily from Tyson plants. We lived in Arkansas, in Springdale, Arkansas, Home, uh, headquarters of Tyson Foods and George's, which is a smaller poultry company. So organizing workers from those plants, it was about getting the workers to speak up. So we began with this petition and workers were gathering signatures in these different plants. With Tyson plants, we gathered almost 200 workers signed the petition and there were more workers who wanted to sign but they were so afraid of retaliation. We lived in a community controlled by the corporate. We have Walmart, we have Tyson, we have 
GBS, we have Georges. So workers are just terrified to speak up. Most of the workers who work in processing plants are the most vulnerable. They are immigrants, they are refugees. Uh, and often these companies are in very rural areas. And so workers don't have any other option but to work in these plants. And actually the immigration in Arkansas began because of the processing uh, because of the processing jobs. So many people were immigrating from Mexico, Central America, and from um, California too. So many of them feel like they are hopeless. They didn't have a voice here because it, it's very difficult to have support from the community that is controlled by these corporations. So for us, it was crucial to organize the workers and to have them to speak up and to kind of like reassuring that right now they are essential. And the government for the first time, they, I mean, they have always been essential, but they will declare them essential, meaning that their job was necessary for the infrastructure of the country. So we had to do a lot of job of, uh, of workers' power to say, we need to play our card. If we are essential, we also need essential benefits to do this job. And so we began organizing workers from these different plants last week. We deliver almost 200 uh, petitions from workers to Tyson plant. And we saw that right after the company started panicking and providing the protective gear equipment, uh, and they started paying lots of money to protect their image. And so now this week they announced new bonuses and new uh, benefits, but still we need to have full benefits for these workers, meaning a full paid sick days, paid uh, quarantine so workers could feel safe staying at home. Right now, uh, when the work, when the company's story to, to, to respond to that, it was already too late. Uh, many of these plants, like for instance, Tyson or George's had announced that they already have positive cases of COVID-19 and yet they were not granted the basic protections. So we are talking about that right now, we don't know how many workers are sick. And so we are demanding this company to taste all the workers because we these workers are resistant to have an outbreak as we've seen across the country. So these workers are speaking up, these workers are desperately uh, yelling to people and to these companies that they don't want to be in the same situation. So right now we are continue organizing workers, continue supporting these workers and gaining ILA support because right now these people need them, need your support. And also I think it's very important to to acknowledge that this problem is just not the workers problem, it's not the poultry workers problem is the work is the problem of everyone because then if we don't work together on this we will have a health crisis an economic crisis and a, and a food crisis on top of this pandemic and we can't survive if we continue like this we keep seeing companies putting profits over people's lives we keep seeing the government backing up these corporations and not caring for these workers as you say as you said uh kathy at the beginning uh, they're just suspendable yes thank you that was uh as usual powerful and passionate and I'll, I'll just note that the what you're seeing in common and a lot of these groups, uh, worker groups that are being that are reporting here today is that they're all in corporate supply chains. And these companies at the top that are profiting from labor are not taking responsibility for the impact that the, the impact on workers now, as they've never taken responsibility for the impact on workers lives in terms of how they make their profits. So it's really something to, to keep an eye on the way our supply chains work. Uh, I am going to now move to Merle Payne from the Centros uh, de Trabajadores Unidos en la Lucha, CITU in Minnesota, who's going to tell us uh, what's happening in the Twin Cities. Hey, um, my name is Merle Payne. I'm the co-director of CITU, El Centro de Trabajadores Unidos en Lucha the Center of Workers United in Struggle. And we are a community-based organization that fights for a voice for all workers to ensure workplace and community democracy in the Twin Cities metro area. Um, our big picture vision of what we're fighting for is to build campaigns that take on the 0.1% that drive the Minnesotan economy 
so that our members, low wage workers, have a space at the table to decide how the entire economy functions, not just a sector, a, a workplace, or an industry. And through that, to be able to fight for racial, gender, and economic justice. So our members work in a lot of low wage industries. We are actively leading a campaign right now with construction workers who build out housing in the Twin Cities metro area. And workers in non-union side of construction work face horrific working conditions. Um, the everyday conditions that workers in the industry tell us that um, you, when you're working in construction, you expect that one out of every four jobs won't pay you. And what other other job would you expect that you get 75% of your pay is just the norm. And, and um, even worse at the extreme, we're seeing cases of labor trafficking. We just brought to justice the first case of labor trafficking in the state of Minnesota in construction in January, and we're actively investigating three other cases. Um, but as we're building out this campaign, our at heart, what we're questioning is not just how, how does housing get built? What are the working conditions? We're actually digging deeper to talk about who gets to decide what's built and for the benefit of who. And we wanna build a model of development that's controlled for and by the community. Um, so under what we've seen since COVID, I think the COVID has really highlighted deep inequities that have existed for a long time and really are pointing out systems that we have been naming for the many years that we've been organizing, right? And um, it should be shocking to us to learn that schools are saying, we can't close schools because children are gonna starve. Like, what an utterly violent society that we live in that we would be that afraid that schools closing mean that children would starve, that that many people would be on the verge of starving. Uh, that, that's horrific. It's also pointing out the deep racial disparities that exist. They, when you look in uh, the Louisiana Department of Health show that while black people make up 32% of the population in the state, they account for over 70% of the deaths. Um, our members in particular here in the Twin Cities, uh, we've heard about a third of the people have lost their jobs completely about a third have lost a number of hours. The overwhelming majority, somebody in their family who is a, a making money for the family has, has lost income. Uh, and we're seeing many people fall through the cracks of the social saf safety networks that exist on the federal and state level. Anyone who is still working, uh, we haven't talked to a single worker who is still working in restaurants or construction or any of these sectors that are getting the proper training or proper safety equipment. Um, and what we're seeing actually, um, the, the worst of it is that COVID is leading to a point where workers are feeling less empowered to be able to fight for their rights, right? An employer says to a worker, if you don't like these working conditions, uh, at least you got a job, right? Like how many people right now don't have work? And um, in construction where you see often a, a contractor controls the worker's housing, uh, because they pay for their housing, they control their work, uh, and they also control their transportation. They have that much level of control over your life. And if you're going to stand up and complain in the middle of a pandemic and get fired and lose your housing and lose your transportation and get kicked to the streets with no job in the middle of a pandemic, it, nobody's going to complain, right? So we are seeing um, just an exacerbation of working conditions. Um, one thing that we've heard from our base consistently is the biggest need that they have is about uh, rent and the biggest fear they have is about paying rent. So what we've been doing to respond is um, we're, we're both looking at immediate needs and we're doing fundraising to be able to support our members who are falling through the cracks of the social safety networks. Um, and in addition to that, we're, we're hiring some new navigator positions to support our members to be able to get access to some of the benefits. Um, we're also picking bigger fights and we're joining a coalition of organizations to demand a moratorium on rent and a moratorium on mortgage. So we have a big action with a caravan of small farmers and um, small business owners, as well as workers who are demanding a statewide moratorium on rent and mortgages where we'll start at US Bank Stadium and go to the governor's 
mansion in St. Paul and we'll be headed down the highway with the tractors of some of the small farmers who are demanding a moratorium on foreclosures of small farms. Um, in addition, we're, we're looking at the bigger fights and how do we not just be reactive in this moment and respond to the immediate needs, which is absolutely needed, but how are we gonna fight for the long-term changes that we've always needed? And that's why this network, and I feel honored to be a part of it, has been really crucial at helping us build and stay focused on these long-term solutions through a worker-driven social responsibility model and construction. So thank you. I mean, one of the things that's always been very clear about Satul is that you understand deeply that it's all very connected from food to housing to work. Um, and just thank you for sharing all that with us. Uh, and it's not just that all the issues are connected, it's that the world is very connected. So the next person we're going to hear from is Scott Nova because this pandemic is impacting workers globally, not just here in the United States. And we are very connected to each other th through a myriad of ways, including our supply chains and how we produce goods. So you'll hear now from Scott Nova, Workers' Rights Consortium, about what garment workers are going through. Thanks, Kathy, and, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, the Worker Rights Consortium is a labor rights advocacy and research organization focused on global manufacturing supply chains, in particular the garment industry, where we work with a, a broad network of allies across more than 50 countries, uh, unions and other worker organizations, advocacy groups, women's organizations, uh, fighting to address the labor rights abuses and sub-poverty wages that define the global garment industry uh, and helping workers seek better wages and conditions, particularly through the creation of enforceable agreements between worker representatives and the brands and retailers that have the bulk of the power in the system. For example, we were able to help create the Accord on Fire and Building Safety in Bangladesh, an enforceable agreement with more than 200 apparel brands and retailers and that brought about the physical transformation of the grossly unsafe garment factories in Bangladesh, uh, making work radically safer for more than two and a half million garment workers. The COVID-19 crisis uh, has been a devastating one for the 50 million workers who make apparel, uh, textiles, and footwear across the world. It's a crisis uh, that uh, has both done great damage to workers and laid bare the inequities that define global manufacturing supply chains. It's a crisis that began with the necessary public health response in Europe and the US uh, to the COVID-19 crisis, including the closure of most retail operations, which led to a sudden and massive decline in demand for apparel. The response of brands and retailers uh, to the crisis was to do everything they could to push the economic burden down the supply chain onto their contracted suppliers and workers. And because of the inequitable structure of production and payment terms in global supply chains, they've been able to do this. In the apparel industry, uh, the clothing that workers make for brands and retailers is not paid for by the brands and retailers until months after the clothing is delivered. The suppliers must shell out all of the upfront cost of production. The workers must do all of the work, the goods must be shipped, and then months later, the brands uh, pay for the goods. So at any given point in time, there are tens of billions of dollars worth of apparel orders in process around the world where workers have completed or done much of the work to complete the clothing, but brands and retailers have yet to pay a penny for the clothes. And so brands and retailers are able to take advantage of this reality by simply refusing to pay for tens of billions of dollars worth of clothing that workers had already produced. The response of suppliers, the manufacturer of the clothing to the brands and retailers actions, unsurprisingly, uh, was to fire large numbers of workers without compensation. Indeed, in a survey we did of fact owners in Bangladesh, 75% uh, of them admitted that they had engaged in large scale dismissals of workers and had not paid to workers the compensation legally required of them. The only way to protect garment workers in this circumstance uh, is to compel brands and retailers to pay their bills because their failure to do so in addition to resulting in mass firings was also giving those suppliers that still had uh, orders to produce 
a powerful incentive to complete those orders by any available means. Uh, so on the one hand, you had mass firings without payment of compensation. On the other hand, uh, you had workers pressured to come to work to finish any orders for which the brands were still willing to pay, subjecting them to serious uh, health risks. I'm happy to say that working with a large range of organizations and with unions around the world, we have begun to see significant success in pressuring brands and retailers to actually pay for the clothing workers have already made. A significant list of key brands and retailers have committed to pay for orders, uh, and that has significantly relieved the burden on suppliers and workers, although many key players still refuse to pay uh, from uh, Walmart uh, to Gap uh, to many fashion brands. And so we're working to continue to pressure brands and retailers simply to pay their bills so that workers' wages can be paid. We're working to support the efforts of unions in the industry to ensure that factories stay closed uh, until such a time as they can be operated safely. We're also working to press for the mobilization of public resources through international financial institutions to provide ongoing income support to garment workers throughout this crisis. A tiny fraction of the trillions of dollars being mobilized uh, for uh, bailouts and stimulus uh, in the US would be enough to pay every garment worker globally for the next several months. And yet, of course, uh, governments uh, in the wealthier countries have given no consideration to the plight of the workers in global supply chains as they've developed their own rescue plans, even though those workers are very much part of large corporations based in the US, based in Europe, uh, that are going to benefit from those rescue plans. So we hope to be able to work with others to mobilize public support through international financial institutions uh, to help ensure that workers can survive through the crisis. And finally, we see both a need and an opportunity here to challenge the underlying inequities that have made the crisis so difficult for workers. The lack of living wages, leaving workers without savings, the inequities in buyer supply relations. So we see an opportunity and we'll work toward deeper reform as the crisis abates. Thank you, Scott. Um... Um, thank you. It's really important not to forget that um, when we say we're all interconnected in this pandemic, we are actually all in interconnected always. Uh, and supply chains globally, supply chains domestically, they actually all uh, present a lot of the same problems. So I'm going to turn it over to Marita Caneda Canedo from Migrant Justice, uh, who we've been working with for the last number of years. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Kathy. My name is Marita Canedo. I'm part of Migrant Justice. Migrant Justice is a grassroots organization in Vermont uh, that organizes dairy immigrant farm workers. So in the past 10 years, uh, migrant farm workers in Vermont have been uh, organizing around human rights. A little bit of the context of the farms here. Uh, the dairy farms are small. An average of workers is four to five. The smallest one have one worker. The biggest one have uh, 15. And uh, what happens is that the farm provides housing. So people live at where they work and they work where they live. And this means that uh, situations of having a worker uh, viable 24 seven during a day, which is to abuses, um, also poor housing conditions. In Vermont, we have a winter of six months. So there are houses that don't have a heating system, no clean water. So farm workers have been organizing around this and we learned about the WSR model uh, from the CIW. And we adapted the model to the dairy industry. We created the Milk with Dignity program. And the Milk with Dignity program started with the first contract with Ben and Jerry's. And now uh, the program is in the third year of rolling out and functioning very well. Uh, it's 20% uh, of the dairy in Vermont uh, under the program. And uh, with this, uh, we, need, we knew that this program is really working and the standards can be enforceable and workers are receiving uh, really good protections of not being fired or laid off. They have sick days, basic days, um, better housing situations. Uh, and so we knew that this model needs to expand and we needed more contracts. So we launched a campaign asking Hannah for supermarkets to join the program. And with this, uh, more farms and farm workers will be under the program and protected. The campaign had to stop because of COVID. We were on a tour and then we were preparing a big action in Maine where the Hannah for headquarters are right now. 
and we had to start responding to the immediate needs uh, that we already knew that were happening. So talking about housing, we know that if somebody gets sick in a farm, it will be very difficult for that person to get in isolation uh, when people are sharing a trailer um, with five other uh, co-workers. Also access to uh, gear, protective gear, access to healthcare, it's an issue here. So uh, some things that we've been doing is partnering with other organizations, service providers, to be sure that the community have access to protective gear and tests, and also to the hospital. We are working on the legislative uh, way, you know, uh, to have uh, at the level, at the state level, to have uh, benefits for workers. So the stimulus packages that the state is going to bring have to include uh, undocumented immigrants and farm workers in the dairy farms. Um, and other ways we've been creating fund, uh, different funds to just uh, provide for the workers that need it. So what we're seeing mostly in Vermont is not people getting sick in the farms because the farms are already isolated and people are actually living in more uh, solitude and out, out of um, access to food. So what we've seen in the long term is that farms are gonna be closing because the prices of milk have decreased so much and corporate uh, co the co-ops that are buying the milk are only gonna pay 85% of the production. So we've seen a reduction in the economy that's gonna affect directly to the workers. Um, and so when you lose your job, you lose your housing situation as well. Uh, so on this, we are partnering with other organizations to try to have a relief um, if people get sick or have to lose their jobs or their housing um, because of COVID-19. But in the long term, we're going to see that um, a lot of people are going to lose their jobs because farms have, are going to be sold. Uh, so on that, we need to uh, expand this program because under the program, like I said, people are going to be protected with basic days and not layoff and also the economic incentive for farms that are going to be able to keep functioning. Thank you, Marita. Thank you. Thank you. And I mean, I think a lot of the, the presentations have reflected how poorly, you know, poorly organized our, our industries and economy is. The fact that neither the industries nor our local governments we're prepared to provide basic health and safety. Uh, it's just a reflection of the of, of pre-existing crises, right? That are intensified, um, and we are grateful for all the community organizations that are stepping into that uh, blank space that needs to be filled, but also pushing for longer-term changes so that this is not our permanent situation. I'm going to now um, move us over to Baltimore to hear from Todd Turkis, co-founder of United Workers. Hi, and, and thank you for inviting us. It's been a really great discussion. And I think you you said it right, Kathy, there's this blank space. And I, we've been talking in, in Baltimore about um, how this crisis, there was a, a crisis before COVID happened that we were pushing up against that our city and our state and, and on the country, as we all can, can tell, was unable to meet our basic fundamental needs for housing, education, work with dignity, healthcare, um, and so forth. And now with um, COVID-19, we're seeing how our, all of ourselves are, all of us, no matter where we are in life, in some ways related to this crisis. And if we don't address these universal needs together, then we are, we are all at risk of getting infected by COVID-19 and, and continuing to, to experience this, this kind of awful, um, 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 situation across the country. United Workers was founded in 2002 to really address um, basic fundamental um, human rights around work with dignity, living wages. Um, we did a big living wages campaign um, and a number of campaigns that were successful organizing day laborers and service sector workers. Um, we won a, sick, a statewide sick leave bill um, and we're seeing the importance of sick leave right now um, and the gaps in, in that, in that um, fabric across the country. We've also organized around housing issues and won pretty recently um, to create the, we created affordable housing trust fund and a fund that is committed, the city committed to $20 million a year into that fund um, with this economic collapse. Some of that's for sure in doubt, um, but there is a fund there and we're actually negotiating right now with the city on how to adjust it so that we can, we can, um, 
address this issue around, around rent, renters um, and, and needing immediate assistance right now that, to deal with this being out, being unemployed and being out of work for, for so long. And we've also been dealing with the environmental environmental justice issues. We we took on um, the trash burning and incinerator crisis. And our city already has an incinerator. It's the worst and polluter in the country. Um, but it had planned to build the biggest um, incinerator in the country. And, and we stopped that from happening. But we're wrestling with an incinerator that was built in 1985. And it's our worst air polluter. Um, and so we're seeing the studies come out around COVID-19. There's a direct link between communities of color and environmental justice issues, particularly around air pollution and um, pre-existing respiratory illnesses and the preponderance of COVID-19 deaths um, in severe cases. And so it's really put that issue um, up there um, in terms of, of, of these cross intersectional ways that this issue is, is relating to people. But soon, right after the crisis happened, we, um, we had a, a virtual Zoom meeting. Um, we, we, we had a once a month um, coalition meeting. We, had, we turned it into a Zoom meeting and it just was clear that people really wanted to be together in any way, shape or form and connect. Um, and, and through that conversation, we formed committees to address the ur urgent needs around housing and homelessness, um, as well as mutual aid and just knowing your rights, basic information about unemployment insurance landlord tenant and food access. Um, we've been pushing with the city through the our emergency COVID response team to house all the homeless and move, and we've called empty the shelters, move folks from congregate living spaces and into the empty hotels that are downtown and vacant right now. We've been able to move 300 homeless into hotels with um, after significant and ongoing public pressure, city council passed a resolution endorsing our demands, calling on the mayor to use emergency funds to do that. Um, there's actually more than enough money at this point for the city um, to move all the homeless into hotels. There's still a stumbling blocks. I think the biggest one in, in, is still this issue of just who is our city for and, and, um, so, and the poor and homeless um, just haven't counted for very much in the city's budgets in the past and how the city has even thought about who it's protecting. So they've waited for people to get infected and now there's at least 50 that have been infected in, in city homeless shelters. Um, and I've had to act um, to move, move and clear out some of the shelters that have, have, um, have infected um, homeless folks in them. And you know, as, as some of our members have said, this is, this is really a death sentence for some folks because the city is not acting quick, quick enough. So we're continuing to put public pressure on the mayor and the state um, to act to do this um, much quicker than they are. Um, our mutual aid teams have really picked up, particularly around this issue of food. Um, we're getting uh, just, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to make, make you ask you to do the last point um, and let Nishmi yeah. jump in. Yeah, I'll just real quick finish. Um, we um, we are, are at this point uh, looking at different, different levers at the state and city level to really um, push forward on the housing issue as well as the other issues that I mentioned, but I just wanted to end with uh, we did a workshop where we, we wrote a collective poem together and one of the participants said that, you know, this crisis, people, politicians are asking for when are we going to get back to normal? And to him, normal was what caused the crisis. And I think that's a really key point. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, and again, over and over again, we see how these things are all terribly connected. Uh, we're going to move now to Nejmi at Pull People First Pennsylvania. Uh, and let's hear what's happening there. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much to Partners for Dignity and Rights for having me tonight. And I'm really honored to be here. And I want to say thank you very much to all of the co-panelists and all of the people attending tonight. I know that oftentimes uh, we don't get enough thanks for the work we do. So I just want to say thank you so, so, so much for everything that you do. Uh, my name is Nijmi Zakia Zarenko, uh, native Pennsylvanian. I live in Philadelphia and I'm a co-founder and volunteer with Put People First PA and also the Pennsylvania Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Uh, Put People First PA uh, was started uh, in 2012. We were founded as a grassroots base building human rights organization 
formed in Pennsylvania to unite the working class across geography, across race, and many other lines of division. I grew up in western Pennsylvania in a small town, but I've lived in Philadelphia over 25 years, and those experiences helped shape me to understand that we have a lot more in common than we have different, but the powers that be really want to keep us separated and divided and conquered. Um, we're a healthcare organization, but healthcare is not a single issue for us. It's a lens uh, and a way of uh, uniting the working class. Um, we, uh, our fight is with healthcare profiteers, uh, but it's also with the state that facilitates the profiteering of insurance companies and other healthcare entities um, at our expense, uh, leading to our sickness and our death. Um, we've won uh, fights against the state, uh, particularly we won the first ever public hearing from the Pennsylvania Insurance Department in 2016. And in 2017, we won statewide town halls to increase transparency, accountability, and participation for people across the state in the rate review process for health care premiums. And Partners for Dignity and Rights has been a partner of ours from the very beginning. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what things were like in Pennsylvania before the pandemic. Uh, as you'll hear uh, directly after this, I'm going to be part of a mass meeting with the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And I'm going to be asking the question of what happens when a pandemic hits on top of a catastrophe. In Pennsylvania, even before the pandemic, we experienced the closure of eight hospitals since the beginning of 2019. Before the coronavirus, 40% of children in Pennsylvania were poor or near poor. Before this crisis, there were over 11,000 cases pending in PA immigration courts. Well before the beginning of March, the minimum wage was and still is at $7.25 an hour. Before COVID-19, up to 60,000 people were evicted in PA every year. We had higher levels of lead exposure in many counties than Flint, Michigan. We had $1 billion of our money given to fossil fuel fracking and chemical companies in the form of tax subsidies. So this is a situation in Pennsylvania before the pandemic. So I want to talk about uh, what we're doing in response, and I want to link five demands to five realities. So as I just mentioned, there have been eight hospitals closed in Pennsylvania since the beginning of 2019. So one of our demands is very simply to reopen the closed hospital. Uh, another reality, and this is something actually that Partners for Dignity and Rights has been you know, sort of looking up and providing research and policy support and found that 1.5 million people in Pennsylvania stand to lose their employer-based health coverage. So very simply, we are demanding that the governor of Pennsylvania, Governor Tom Wolf, apply for a waiver to immediately expand Medicaid to every resident in Pennsylvania. Another reality we know in Pennsylvania is there's a chronic shortage of personal protective equipment for healthcare workers and other frontline workers, many of whom are in our base. And so we are demanding that the governor immediately direct production of personal protective equipment for healthcare workers and other frontline workers. Another reality is that we know that you can be an asymptomatic carrier of the virus. So we are demanding universal testing. Currently, um, testing is happening in outdoor facilities, the same places that they're trying to treat us instead of reopening hospitals. Um, we also know that since the beginning of the pandemic, the private healthcare industry has shed 43,000 workers in the middle of a pandemic to maintain profitability, once again, putting profit over people's lives. So our demand for our governor is to bring private healthcare facilities under public control for the duration of the pandemic and beyond. We've been mobilizing these demands through our nonviolent Medicaid army and our nine chapters throughout the state and members in 17 counties. Our nonviolent Medicaid army is our base modeled after the nonviolent army of the poor that Dr. King talked about in the original Poor People's Campaign. Uh, yep. I'm sorry, we're just at time. This is so painful. You have no idea Perfect. how difficult it is to stop any of you. <laughs> it's one well, of the I'll just end, Kathy, I'll just end by saying you can find out more about our work at putpeoplefirstpa.org. Thank you so much. No, this is, I'm almost 
glad we only have one more person now because I wouldn't want to hear another a lot lot more of this, but because it's really hard to stop any of you. It's extraordinary what everyone's doing. And that was um, really powerful, Nijmi, as you always are. Thank you. Uh, we are now going to move over to talk about what's happening in education with Letha Muhammad, who um, is with Education Justice uh, Alliance and is part of our Dignity in Schools campaign. Thank you, Letha. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to my co-presenters. Uh, I really appreciated uh, hearing about the important work that you all's organizations are doing. Um, and I'm here uh, representing Dignity in Schools campaign. Uh, we're a national coalition of over 100 organizations stretched across 27 states. Um, we're working to dismantle the school to prison pipeline and to transform our public schools uh, into a system that values the humanity and dig dignity of all of our students. We also work to support uh, students and communities as well as parents uh, as decision makers in shaping public policy uh, to ensure our public education systems serve us all well. We're led in these fights by young people, by parents, by teachers, uh, again, across the country in 27 states. Um, and we're fighting to dismantle systems of oppression in our public education system. Um, in particular, looking at the ways in which racism and criminalization occur in schools and cause black and brown students in particular um, to be pushed out. We also um, promote a vision for public education that focuses on uh, the development of the whole child and the value that all children bring uh, to our public education system. As I was uh, listening to everybody talk um, tonight, the thing that stood out for me, right, is across all these different sectors, thinking about um, worker rights, thinking about um, healthcare rights, thinking um, about farm workers or migrants. I, I think education ties into all of those spaces, right? Because the majority of these workers that we're talking about and naming are, um, have children. A lot of them have children that access public education. And a lot of times it's our children, right, are the ones who aren't being served the best um, as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, you know, hitting our, our world, uh, inequities that have always been in, in effect in public schools are even more um, exacerbated in our communities. We feel it more uh, from the ways that schools are now shut down across the country, the families that are most directly impacted by those shutdowns and lack of access uh, to food uh, and to technologies are often working class black and brown families. Um, we have families across the country who are struggling through this period of remote learning that don't have access to technology, computers or internet uh, services. We also know that the crisis in our healthcare is also impacting those same families. You know, our, our members of DSC have had to pivot and adjust, right? The work that we're doing in our own communities to just uh, help families care for the basic needs is providing food and mutual aid uh, to our communities, providing support for parents to help them around uh, remote learning within their homes. So, you know, this crisis is just further showing us the inequities that exist within our public school system. And so we're committed at the Dignity Schools campaign uh, to continue to fight uh, to dismantle oppressive systems within our public school systems. Um, we're uh, fighting for the dignity and humanity of, of all students, and we're pushing for healing and restorative justice practices to be placed in our classrooms as we go back into schools, because we recognize that the trauma that young people and their families are experiencing because of this pandemic is also going to impact the ways in which they show up in the schools. And we want our schools to provide a safe space for those young people when they come back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the perils of trying to do all this from home, right? <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I don't, uh, and thank everyone for, for hanging in there. I can see most people are still with us and we really appreciate that because this is definitely a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, and there's a lot going on. 
I, I don't envy the next person because she has to give us reflections on all this. And this was a lot, but I wanna uh, introduce Regan Pritzker, who is the trustee at the Libra Foundation. I know it's a sort of standard thing to say, oh, our foundation partners, they're really partners. Um, they're really with us. It's true a lot of the times, sometimes it's more complicated. I have to say in the case of Libra Foundation, the rhetoric is absolutely reality. One of the best, most authentic, most genuine supporters of social justice and grassroots work across the country. And we are all deeply grateful for the uh, wonderful role that you play and uh, really looking forward to your impressions. So let's hand it over to Regan. Thank you so much, Kathy. And, and just a huge deep appreciation to Kathy and to Cynthia and to Lupe and Tim and Magali and Merle and Marita and Todd and Nujmi and Talitha for um, really moving and inspiring me. And it's true, it is really hard to go last, except what I'm feeling good about is I don't have to say much because you all um, did an incredible job of summarizing your work. And it's great to know that there are places people can go for more information. Um, I'm, I'm really inspired. Um, I'm feeling a little emotional after hearing all of these stories. Um, and I'm, I did, my reflection is really just that I'm reminded that um, essential workers are always essential. It's really been highlighted in the media, you know, people standing on their balconies and clapping and I'm super excited about that. Um, but just to underline that this is <clears throat> a journey that has been going on for a long time. Folks have been working and organizing around these issues for a long time. And so seeing those, um, those, those threads and that continuity and how we can move from response to um, really activism and organizing to make these, these changes more sustainable and permanent is something I'm really inspired to hear from all of our presenters. So thank you for that. Um, and then the other piece is just that these are not isolated struggles. Uh, several of the speakers mentioned this, and um, I really appreciated the framing of reminding us that all of this organizing sits inside a broader vision and framework of racial, gender, and economic justice and human rights. Um, and, you know, we, what we can do, what can we do? A lot of the folks on the phone are asking, how do we get involved? What can I do? Um, I think the, the call to action is really clear in terms of moving resources to support the front lines, uh, those that can best identify systemic solutions. And we can help make those changes and solutions more permanent by engaging. So we can do that in different ways. As a funder, it's easy to go first to funding. So moving not just small grants, but large, uh, chunky long-term support to frontline organizations and the infrastructure networks that, that support them. Um, but you can also fundraise. Uh, so funding, fundraising, promoting these organizations and their campaigns within your own networks, as Kathy mentioned at the top of the call, and connect, reach out. Folks are posting their websites and their campaigns. So whether it's in your region or through a thematic that you care about, um, you know, reach out to those folks to build relationships. I think that's a really important way of uh, making this work move forward. Um, and um, yeah, just a huge thank you to Partners for Dignity and Rights for hosting this conversation. It's the beginning of a series of conversations in celebration of their 15th anniversary and um, a specific uh, offering if folks are interested in giving to this work. Um, there's a Giving Tuesday event uh, that's being planned for May 5th and you can support Partners for Dignity and Rights or these important partner organizations through that, um, through that mode. Um, if you're so inspired and if you're able. Uh, that's all I have to say. I just want to thank everyone. I'm, I'm so grateful for the work you are doing every day. Thank you. And thank you again, everyone for, thank you, Regan, really. And thank you for everyone for hanging in there. Of course, despite our, our real heartfelt commitment to staying on time, we will need a little bit more time if we're going to go to the Q&A. So I want to uh, just bring everyone into sort of the gallery so we can look at uh, all the questions together. The kind of questions that we've gotten is how to support your campaigns. How does this work at this moment where there's where there's this scarcity conversation uh, in, over, overlapping with needs for solidarity? Specifically, there was a question for Immokalee of, is there some tension between getting PPE to farm workers and healthcare workers, for example? 
Um, there was some, uh, Nijmi mentioned the support for healthcare workers in her state, but there was also another question of how does any of this work connect to healthcare workers? And finally, Scott, there was a question for you on have we moved those international financial institutions, not the simplest thing, uh, and move those brands? So I'm going to just let people answer sort of popcorn style because we're over time uh, and uh, jump in. And if there are other questions from those listening, I'm looking at the question box, you can go ahead and ask. Those are the ones we have so far. So do people wanna jump in and talk about what kind of support you could use? I think you're all on mute if you don't realize it. Well, Kathy, I could try to quickly answer the question about enforceable agreements while while other people prepare uh, to respond on the other point, if that's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, the question, there's a question about the, the invocation of the terms of the accord to challenge what the brands are doing. And that is going on of the debates within the accord steering committee where various articles of the accord have been cited as obligating the brands uh, to behave in a manner differently from how they're currently behaving. And that's been one of the tools that's been utilized uh, to, to successfully press certain brands to change their practice on payment for orders. Uh, so that's been encouraging. Um, in, uh, I can't remember that the second question was, oh, on the IFIs, those discussions are ongoing. Um, we're cautiously optimistic that there will be some funds mobilized from IFIs, although obviously there are, are, there's competition for dollars and an enormous need globally, but we're cautiously optimistic about movement for supply chain workers specifically, though it's too early to tell for certain. And then of course, if there are funds mobilized, it will be vital to ensure they actually get to workers. And we focused in particular on defining eligibility broadly to include all workers who are making money to make apparel when the crisis started, even if they are informal workers, even if they are contract workers. Thank you all. Thank you, Scott. Um, and for those who don't know much about the Accord, I would definitely look into it. It's been one of the most um, significant global achievements around reigning in corporate power and getting workers some basic protections. Uh, it's true. And it's an honor to work with you on it. The, so do others have specific suggestions for those listening in terms of how they can support or any reflections on the scarcity conversation that makes it seem like there is a trade-off when in fact, um, when one looks deeper, there shouldn't be. Sure, um, I can jump in really quickly uh, to respond on the part of CIW. Um, so in terms of how to help and support these efforts, I, you know, was in, we were incredibly impressed with many of the presenters who similarly had built um, really clear, you know, websites and, and places where people could go to get information about how to support. Um, I know that we did, I posted in the chat box, uh, the link to where anybody can go to follow the CIW's ongoing efforts to, um, to procure greater healthcare resources for Immokalee. Again, uh, we just got the first big step with that, with getting testing, um, but we will, that doesn't mean, you know, work is done. Uh, and so we're gonna be continuing to do that and we'll keep that page consistently updated with um, ongoing ways for people to support. So I can respond on that. Um, and, you know, for everyone to, to keep an eye out. Uh, and then in terms of scarcity, I think that one of the, one of the things that, that we've realized is that there is, you know, and a lot of people have talked about the gaps and the idea of stepping into those gaps as these community-based organizations, you know, in Immokalee, when it comes, you know, masks is a good example of that. I think we specifically didn't seek out um, N95 masks, kind of respecting that there was a call on the part of many healthcare workers to preserve those masks for people who are in COVID specific healthcare uh, zones, but nevertheless really pushed for high quality masks that could uh, prevent illness and, and, and ensured, um, you know, we worked with a lot of public health advisors to ensure that we were getting the right kinds of materials. And there was even a group of farm worker women who, you know, got tired of waiting and said, you know, if we can get the materials, we're gonna get the right design and sewed hundreds and hundreds of masks to be handed out in Immokalee. So I think on one hand, there is this concept of scarcity and that is real in a lot of ways, but I think that there are, there are ways to work around that to still ensure that everyone has what they need, especially when we have communities who often uh, are facing that scarcity, scarcity stepping up to 
figure out ways to take care of themselves, you know, and I think that that's really what we've seen in Immokalee, both on the organizing front and then also in just some of those really basic ways, whether it's, you know, CIW creating um, the, you know, posters and education materials in the correct language and format for our community or farm worker women sewing masks themselves, you know, obviously um, in an ideal world, that's not the, the position that, that anyone would be in, but I think that uh, thinking creatively and not underestimating our, our community's ability to take care of itself is also important in times like this. I think that is, uh, unless someone has something else to add because we're over time, um, I think that's just such a beautiful place to end and such a reflection of the kind of world we want to live in, sort of being sensitized to needs of everyone impacted and everyone involved, what kind of masks you look for, uh, being just a beautiful example. And I think it really, oh, Lisa, Lisa did you want to jump in? Uh, oh, and Marita, um, so no. I am then not going to wrap this up. So Lisa, Marita, why don't you jump in? Uh, hey, thank you, Kathy. Uh, then there's one yeah. question I want to flag and before we wrap up because uh, Susan Blasting sent in a very compelling question. Uh, Lisa, so, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to um, point our audience members to our website, uh, dignityinschools.org to find out uh, read our public statement on um, public education and the importance, the demands we're calling for state and federal officials to pay attention to that was crafted by our members around what we need and expect um, for public education to serve all children, and in particular, black and brown children. And then also there is, of course, a, a donate now button on our website. So we encourage you to support our efforts. We're getting ready to launch a COVID-19 rapid response fund for our member organizations to continue to support them in their mutual aid work um, within their communities across the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Marita? Yeah, I just want to increase the need of masking gloves as the ones that you know in the dairy industry, masking gloves are used for everyday work and these things are now um, not finding anywhere. So they are different than the masks that people are using just to take care of the COVID and also looking at the long term, what we are seeing, like I, I said before, we are seeing farms that are going to be closing people losing their jobs and losing their housing because the corporations are deciding these prices of the milk going down and we're dumping milk where in other places people are needing of food. So I think we need to look at the long term that there are programs that are models that bring these companies to really be responsible and change the economy. The essential workers are called essential but are forgotten and disposable. And we know that they have been essential all, all this time. So now is the time to really demonstrate that COVID is not what is killing us. There are other things that are killing us bigger that is the capitalism in this system that we can change now. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure where it would have been better to end because that was almost just, that was just as great. So I'm gonna leave it at that moment. I will note that we had a question just pointing out that uh, Mitch McConnell has backed off on not giving states and cities uh, COVID response money so long as we release corporations from any liability uh, to workers and others in this moment. Uh, that That's a whole nother virtual conversation, right, to have, but I think it does point out the stark difference between what we're trying to do here and the kind of divisions and trade-offs um, our opposition is pushing forward. Uh, at some other point, I would uh, thank you for sending that question. We want to explore that, but I think that it is solidarity is the answer, right? Uh, pragmatic, real, genuine solidarity and not tolerating these kind of trade-offs because in particular in this moment, it's clear that it's about people's lives. We, will, we thank you for listening. We are going to send you a follow-up email that links you to all these amazing initiatives that tells you what you can do uh, in this moment, where you could sign on, where you could donate, where you could track, where you could monitor these efforts. And um, not only through us, but directly with our partners. And uh, we so appreciate you joining us and uh, hope we will see you next time. And thank you to all our speakers, to Regan, to Cynthia who couldn't stay. And I hope we can do this again. Okay, bye everyone. Be safe, wash your hands. Good night.